Part One of Infamous Day Marines at Pearl Harbor, 7 December 1941. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Infamous Day Marines at Pearl Harbor, 7 December 1941, by Robert J. Cressman and J. Michael Winger. Part One. On the afternoon of 6 December 1941, Tai Sing Lu, the colorful Pearl Harbor Navy Yard photographer, arranged with platoon sergeant Charles R. Christenot, the non-commissioned officer in charge of the main gate at the Naval Yard, to have his Marines pose for a photograph between 8.30 and 9.30 Sunday morning in front of the new concrete main gate. The photo was to be for a Christmas card as war clouds gathered over the pacific basin in late nineteen forty one the united states pacific fleet operated as it had since may nineteen forty from pearl harbor while the security of that fleet and for the island of oahu lay in the army's hands that of the navy yard and the naval air stations at pearl harbor and kinaho bay lay in the hands of marines in addition on board the fleet's battleships aircraft carriers and some of its cruisers marines provided security served as orderlies for embarked flag officers and ship's captains and manned secondary anti-aircraft and machine-gun batteries seagoing duties familiar to the corps since its inception the marine barracks at pearl harbor comprised a barracks detachment and two companies a and b the men living in a comfortable three-story concrete barracks company a manned the main gate at the submarine base and naval yard and other distant outposts providing yard security while company b enforced traffic regulations and maintained proper police and order under the auspices of the yard police officer in addition marines ran the navy yard fire department elements of marine defense battalions made pearl harbor their home too residing in the several one hundred man temporary wooden barracks buildings that had been completed during nineteen forty and nineteen forty one less commodious but no less important was the burgeoning air base that marines of marine aircraft group m a g two later twenty one had hewn and hammered out near barber's point ewa mooring mast field home for a marine aircraft group consisting of fighting scout bombing and utility squadrons on twenty seventh november having been privy to intelligence information gleaned from intercepted and translated japanese diplomatic message traffic admiral harold r stark the chief of naval operations and general george c marshall the army's chief of staff sent a war warning to their principal commanders on oahu admiral husband e kimmel the commander-in-chief pacific fleet and lieutenant-general walter c short the commander of the hawaiian department thus adjured to take appropriate defensive measures and feeling that his more exposed advance bases needed strengthening kimmel set in motion a plan that had been completed as early as ten november to provide planes for midway and wake the latter was to receive fighters twelve grumman f four f three wildcats of marine fighter squadron b m f two eleven while Midway was to get scout bombers from Marine Scout Bomber Squadron, BMSB-231. The following day, 28 November 1941, the carrier Enterprise, CV-6, departed Pearl in Task Force 8 under Vice Admiral William F. Halsey, Jr., Commander, Aircraft, Battle Force, embarking BMF-211 at sea vmsb two three one was to embark in another carrier lexington c v two in task force twelve under rear admiral john h newton on five december at the outset apparently no one except the squadron commanders knew their respective destinations but the men of vmf two eleven and vmsb two thirty one meanwhile apparently ordered their affairs and made ready for what was to appear as advanced base exercises 
among those men seeing to his financial affairs at iwa mooring mast field on three december nineteen forty one was first lieutenant richard e fleming u s m c r who wrote to his widowed mother this is the last time i'll be able to write for probably some time i'm sorry i can't give you any details it's that secret on the fifth task force twelve sailed from pearl eighteen light gray vaught s b two u three vindicators from v m s b two three one under forty one year old major clarence j buddy chapel then made the one point seven hour flight from iwa and landed on board lexington along with the lady lex air group planes recovered the force set course for midway the lexington departed pearl harbor on the morning of five december that afternoon saw the arrival of battleship division one from gunnery exercises in the hawaiian operating area and the three dreadnoughts arizona bb thirty nine nevada bb thirty six and oklahoma bb thirty seven moored in their assigned berths at the keys along ford island the movements of the ships in and out of pearl harbor had been the object of much interest on the part of the espionage system operating out of the japanese consulate in honolulu throughout the year nineteen forty one for the information its operatives were providing went to support an ambitious and bold operation that had taken shape over several months unbeknownst to admiral kimmel a japanese task force under the command of vice admiral chiuchi nagumo formed around six carriers and the most powerful force of its kind ever assembled by any naval power had set out from the remote kuril islands on twenty seven november it observed radio silence and steamed via the comparatively less travelled northern pacific nagumo's mission was to destroy the united states pacific fleet and thus ensure its being unable to threaten the japanese southern operation poised to attack american british and dutch possessions in the far east all of the warning signs made available to admiral kimmel and general short pointed toward hostilities occurring within the foreseeable future but not on oahu war however was about to burst upon the marines at pearl harbor like a thunderclap from a clear sky suddenly hurled into war some two hundred miles north of oahu vice admiral nagumo's first air fleet formed around the aircraft carriers akagi kaga soryu hiru shokaku and zuikaku pressed southward in the pre-dawn hours of seven december nineteen forty one at five fifty the dark gray ships swung to port into the brisk easterly wind and commenced launching an initial strike of a hundred and eighty four planes ten minutes later a second strike would take off after an hour's interval once airborne the fifty one aichi d three a one type ninety nine dive bombers b a l s eighty nine nakajima b five n two attack planes kates used in high-level bombing or torpedo bombing roles and forty three mitsubishi a six m two type zero zero fighters zeros led by commander mitsuo fushida akagi's air group commander wheeled around climbed to three thousand meters and droned toward the south at six sixteen the only other military planes aloft that morning were douglas s b d dauntlesses from enterprise flying searches ahead of the carrier as she returned from wake island army boeing b seventeen flying fortresses heading in from the mainland and navy consolidated p b y catalinas on routine patrols out of the naval air stations at ford island and Kaneohe that morning fifteen of the ships at pearl harbor numbered marine detachments among their complements eight battleships two heavy cruisers four light cruisers and one auxiliary a sixteenth detachment assigned to the auxiliary target gunnery training ship utah a g sixteen was ashore on temporary duty at the fourteenth naval district rifle range at pu'uloa point at seven fifty three lieutenant frank erickson u s c g the naval air station n a s ford island duty officer 
watched privates first class frank dudovic and james d young and private paul o zeller u s m c r the marine color guard march up and take post for colors satisfied that all looked in order outside ericsson stepped back into the office to check if the assistant officer of the day was ready to play the recording for sounding colors on the loudspeaker the sound of two heavy explosions however sent the coast guard pilot running to the door he reached it just in time to see a kate fly past ten ten dock and release a torpedo the markings on the plane which looked like balls of fire left no question as to its identity the explosion of the torpedo as it struck the battleship california bb forty four moored near the administration building left no doubt as to its intent the marines didn't wait for colors ericsson recalled later the flag went right up but the tune was general quarters as all hell broke loose around them tudovic young and zeller unflinchingly hoisted the stars and stripes with the same smartness and precision that had characterized their participation in peacetime ceremonies at the crew barracks on ford island corporal clifton webster and private first class albert e yale headed for the roof immediately after general quarters sounded in the direct line of fire from strafing planes they set up a machine gun across oahu as japanese planes swept in over nas kaneohe bay the marine detachment there initially the only men who had weapons hurried to their posts and began firing at the attackers since the american aircraft carriers were at sea the japanese targeted the battleships which lay moored off fort island at one end of battleship row lay nevada at eight o two the battleship's fifty caliber machine guns opened fire on the torpedo planes bearing down on them from the direction of the navy yard her gunners believed that they had shot one down almost immediately an instant later however a torpedo penetrated her port side and exploded ahead of nevada lay arizona with the repair ship vestal a r four alongside preparing for a tender availability major allen shapley had been relieved the previous day as detachment commanding officer by captain john h earl jr who had come over to arizona from tennessee b b forty three awaiting transportation to the naval operating base san diego and assignment to the second marine division shapley was lingering on board to play first base on the battleship's baseball team in a game scheduled with the squad from the carrier enterprise c v six after the morning meal he started down to his cabin to change seated at breakfast sergeant john m baker heard the air raid alarm followed closely by an explosion in the distance and machine-gun fire corporal earl c nightingale leaving the table had paid no heed to the alarm at the outset since he had no anti-aircraft battle station but ran to the door on the port side that opened out onto the quarter-deck at the sound of the distant explosion looking out he saw what looked like a bomb splash alongside nevada marines from the ship's color guard then burst breathlessly into the messing compartment saying that they were being attacked as general quarters sounded baker and nightingale among the others headed for their battle station aft congestion at the starboard ladder that led through casement number nine prompted second lieutenant carlton e simonson u s m c r the ship's junior marine officer to force his way through both baker and nightingale noted in passing that the five inch fifty one there was already manned and baker heard corporal bernus l bond the gun captain tell the crew to train it out nightingale noted that the men seemed extremely calm and collected as lieutenant simonson led the marines up the ladder on the starboard side of the mainmast tripod an eight hundred kilogram converted armor-piercing shell dropped by a cake from kaga ricocheted off the side of turret four penetrating the deck it exploded in the vicinity of the captain's pantry sergeant baker was following simonson up the mainmast when the bomb exploded shrapnel cutting down the officer as he reached the first platform he crumpled to the deck nightingale seeing him flat on his back bent over him to see what he could do 
but simonson dying motioned for his men to continue on up the ladder nightingale continued up to secondary aft and reported to major shapley that nothing could be done for simonson an instant later a rising babble of voices in the secondary station prompted nightingale to call for silence no sooner had the tense quiet settled in when suddenly a terrible explosion shook the ship as a second eight hundred kilogram bomb dropped by a kate from hiru penetrated the deck near turret two and set off arizona's forward magazines an instant after the terrible fireball mushroomed upward nightingale looked out and saw a mass of flames forward of the mainmast and much in the tradition of private william anthony of the main reported that the ship was afire we'd might as well go below major shapley said looking round we're no good here sergeant baker started down the ladder nightingale the last man out followed shapley down the port side of the mast the railings hot to the touch as they made their way below baker had just reached the searchlight platform when he heard someone shout you can't use the ladder private first-class kenneth d goodman hearing that and apparently assuming incorrectly as it turned out that the ladder down was indeed unusable instinctively leapt in desperation to the crown of turret three miraculously he made the jump with only a slight ankle injury shapley nightingale and baker however among others stayed on the ladder and reached the boat deck only to find it a mass of wreckage and fire with the bodies of the slain lying thick upon it badly charred men staggered to the quarter-deck some reached it only to collapse and never rise among them was corporal bond burned nearly black who had been ordering his crew to train out number nine five inch fifty one at the outset of the battle sadly he would not survive his wounds shapley and corporal nightingale made their way across the ship between turret three and turret four where shapley stopped to talk with lieutenant commander samuel g fuqua arizona's first lieutenant and by that point the ship's senior officer on board fuqua who appeared exceptionally calm as he helped men over the side listened as shapley told him that it appeared that a bomb had gone down the stack and triggered the explosion that doomed the ship since fighting the massive fires consuming the ship was a hopeless task fuqua told the marine that he had ordered arizona abandoned fuqua the first man sergeant baker encountered on the quarter-deck proved an inspiration his calmness gave me courage baker later declared and i looked around to see if i could help fuqua however ordered him over the side too baker complied shapley and nightingale meanwhile reached the mooring quay alongside which arizona lay when an explosion blew them into the water nightingale started swimming for a pipeline a hundred and fifty feet away but soon found that his ebbing strength would not permit him to reach it shapley seeing the enlisted man's distress swam over and grasped his shirt front and told him to hang on to his shoulders the strain of swimming with nightingale however proved too much for even the athletic shapley who began to experience difficulties himself seeing his former detachment commander foundering nightingale loosened his grip on his shoulders and told him to go the rest of the way alone shapley stopped however and firmly grabbed him by the shirt he refused to let go i would have drowned nightingale later recounted but for the major sergeant baker had seen their travail but too far away to help made it to ford island alone several bombs meanwhile fell close aboard nevada moored astern of arizona which had begun to hemorrhage fuel from ruptured tanks fire spread to the oil that lay thick upon the water threatening nevada as the latter counter flooded to correct the list her acting commanding officer lieutenant commander francis j thomas u s n r decided that his ship had to get under way to avoid further damage due to proximity of arizona after receiving a signal from the yard tower to stand out of the harbor nevada singled up her lines at eight twenty she began moving from her berth twenty minutes later
oklahoma nevada's sister ship moored inboard of maryland in berth f five meanwhile manned air defense stations at about seven fifty seven to the sound of gunfire after a junior officer passed the word over the general announcing system that it was not a drill providing a suffix of profanity to underscore the fact all men not having an anti-aircraft defense station were ordered to lay below the armored deck crews at the five inch and three inch batteries meanwhile opened ready use lockers a heavy shock followed by a loud explosion came soon thereafter as a torpedo slammed home in the battleship's port side the oki soon began listing to port oil and water cascaded over the decks making them extremely slippery and silencing the ready-duty machine gun on the forward superstructure two more torpedoes struck home the massive rent in the ship's side rendered the desperate attempts at damage control futile as ensign paul h backus hurried from his room to his battle station on the signal bridge he passed his friend second lieutenant harry h gaver jr one of oklahoma's marine detachment junior officers on his knees attempting to close a hatch on the port side alongside the barbette of turret one part of the trunk which led from the main deck to the magazines there were men trying to come up from below at the time harry was trying to close the hatch bacchus never saw gaver again as the list increased and the oily wet decks made even standing up a chore oklahoma's acting commanding officer ordered her abandoned to save as many lives as possible directed to leave over the starboard side away from the direction of the roll most of oklahoma's men managed to get off to be picked up by boats arriving to rescue survivors sergeant thomas e haley and privates first class marlin s seal and james h curran jr swam to the nearby maryland haley and seal turned to the task of rescuing shipmates seal remaining on maryland's blister ledge throughout the attack pulling men from the water later although inexperienced with that type of weapon haley and curran manned maryland's anti-aircraft guns west virginia rescued privates george b bierman and carl r mcpherson who not only helped rescue others from the water but also helped to fight that battleship's fires sergeant woodrow a polk a bomb fragment in his left hip sprained his right ankle in abandoning ship while someone clambered into a launch over sergeant leo g wares and nearly drowned him in the process gunnery sergeant norman l courier stepped from oklahoma's red hull to a boat dry shod wares as haley and curran soon found a short-handed anti-aircraft gun on maryland's boat deck and helped pass ammunition private first class arthur j brook tennis whose column in the december nineteen forty one issue of the leatherneck would be the last to chronicle the peacetime activities of oklahoma's marines dislocated his left shoulder in the abandonment but survived a little over two weeks shy of his twenty-third birthday corporal willard d darling an oklahoma marine who was a native oklahoman had meanwhile clambered on board a motor launch as it headed shoreward darling saw fifty-one-year-old commander fred m rohau medical corps the capsized battleship's senior medical officer in a state of shock struggling in the oily water since rohau seemed to be drowning darling unhesitatingly dove in and along with shipfitter first class william s thomas kept him afloat until a second launch picked them up strafing japanese planes and shrapnel from american guns falling around them prompted the abandonment of the launch at a dredge pipeline so darling jumped in and directed the doctor to follow him again the marine rescued rohau who proved too exhausted to make it on his own and towed him to shore maryland meanwhile in board of oklahoma promptly manned her anti-aircraft guns at the outset of the attack her machine guns opening fire immediately she took two bomb hits but suffered only minor damage her marine detachment suffered no casualties on board tennessee bb forty three marine captain chevy s white 
who had just turned twenty-eight the day before was standing officer of the deck watch as that battleship lay moored inboard of west virginia b b forty eight in berth f six since the commanding officer and the executive officer were both ashore command devolved upon lieutenant commander james w adams jr the ship's gunnery officer summoned topside at the sound of the general alarm and hearing all hands to general quarters over the ship's general announcing system adams sprinted to the bridge and spotted white en route over the din of battle adams shouted for the marine to get the ship in condition z z as quickly as possible white did so by the time adams reached his battle station on the bridge white was already at his own battle station directing the ship's anti-aircraft guns during the action in which the ship took one bomb that exploded on the center gun of torret two and another that penetrated the crown of torret three the latter breaking apart without exploding white remained at his unprotected station coolly and courageously directing the battleship's anti-aircraft battery tennessee claimed four enemy planes shot down west virginia outboard of tennessee had been scheduled to sail for puget sound due for overhaul on seventeen november but had been retained in hawaiian waters owing to the tense international situation in her exposed moorings she also absorbed six torpedoes while a seventh blew her rudder free prompt counter-flooding however prevented her from turning turtle as oklahoma had done and she sank upright alongside tennessee on board california moored singly off the administration building at the naval air station junior officer of the deck on board had been second lieutenant clifford b drake relieved by ensign herbert c jones u s n r drake went down to the wardroom for breakfast cadota figs followed by steak and eggs where around seven fifty five he heard airplane engines and explosions as japanese dive bombers attacked the air station the general quarters alarm then summoned the crew to battle stations drake forsaking his meal hurried to the foretop by eight o three the two ready machine guns forward of the bridge had opened fire followed shortly thereafter by guns number two and four of the anti-aircraft battery as the gunners depleted the ready use ammunition however two torpedoes struck home in quick succession california began to settle as massive flooding occurred meanwhile fumes from the ruptured fuel tanks she had been fueled to ninety five per cent capacity the previous day drove out the men assigned to the party attempting to bring up ammunition for the guns by hand a call for men to bring up additional gas masks proved fruitless as the volunteers who included private arthur e senior could not reach the compartment in which they were stored California's losing power, because of the torpedo damage, soon relegated Lieutenant Drake in her foretop to the role of a reporter of what was going on, a somewhat confused young lieutenant suddenly hurled into war. As California began listing after the torpedo hits, Drake began pondering his own ship's fate. Comparing his ship's list with that of Oklahoma's, he dismissed California's rolling over, thinking who ever heard of a battleship capsizing oklahoma however did a few moments later meanwhile at about eight ten in response to a call for a chain of volunteers to pass five inch twenty five ammunition private senior again stepped forward and soon clambered down to the c l division compartment there he saw ensign jones lieutenant drake's relief earlier that morning standing at the foot of the ladder on the third deck directing the ammunition supply for almost twenty minutes senior and his shipmates toiled under jones direction until a bomb penetrated the main deck at about eight thirty and exploded on the second deck plunging the compartment into darkness as acrid smoke filled the compartment senior reached for his gas mask which he had lain on a shell box behind him and put it on hearing someone say mr jones has been hit senior flashed his flashlight over on the ensign's face and saw that it was all bloody 
His white coat also had blood all over it. Senior and another man then carried Jones as far as the M Division compartment, but the ensign would not let them carry him any further. Leave me alone, he gasped insistently. I'm done for. Get out of here before the magazines go off. Soon thereafter, however, before he could get clear, Senior felt the shock of an explosion from down below and collapsed unconscious. Jones' gallantry, which earned him a posthumous medal of honor, impressed Private Howard M. Haynes, who had been confined before the attack, awaiting a bad conduct discharge. After the battle, a contrite Haynes, a mean character who had shown little or no respect for anything or anyone before 7 December, approached Lieutenant Drake and said that he, Haynes, was alive because of the actions that Ensign Jones had taken. God, he said, give me a chance to prove I'm worth it. His actions that morning in the crucible of war earned Haynes a recommendation for retention in the service. Most of California's Marines, like Haynes, survived the battle. Private First Class Earl D. Wallen and Privates Roy E. Lee, Jr. and Shelby C. Shook, however, did not. Nor did the badly burned Private First Class John A. Blount, Jr., who succumbed to his wounds on 9 December. Nevada's attempt to clear the harbor, meanwhile, inspired those who witnessed it. Her magnificent effort prompted a stepped-up effort by Japanese dive-bomber pilots to sink her. One 250-kilogram bomb hit her boat deck just aft of a ventilator trunk and 12 feet to the starboard side of the center line, about halfway between the stack and the end of the boat deck, setting off laid-out 5-inch ready-use ammunition. Spraying fragments decimated the gun crews. The explosion wrecked the galley and blew open the starboard door of the compartment, venting into casement number nine and starting a fire that swept through the casemate, wrecking the gun. Although he had been seriously wounded by the blast that had hurt both of his legs and stripped much of his uniform from his body, Corporal Joe R. Driscoll disregarded his own condition and insisted that he man another gun. He refused medical treatment, assisted other wounded men instead, and then helped battle the flames. He did not quit until those fires were out. Another 250-kilogram bomb hit Nevada's bridge, penetrating down into casemate number six and starting a fire. The blast had also severed the water pipes providing circulating water to the water-cooled machine guns on the foremast guns in the charge of Gunnery Sergeant Charles E. Douglas. Intense flames enveloped the forward superstructure, endangering Douglas and his men, and prompting orders for them to abandon their station. They steadfastly remained at their posts, however, keeping the fifty caliber Brownings firing amidst the swirling black smoke until the end of the action. End of part one. Part two of Infamous Day, Marines at Pearl Harbor, 7 December 1941, by Robert James Cressman and J. Michael Wenger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Unlike the battleships, the enemy had caught moored on Battleship Row, Pennsylvania, BB-38, the fleet flagship, lay on keel blocks sharing dry dock number one at the Navy Yard with Casson, DB-372, and Downs, DD-375, two destroyers side by side ahead of her. Three of Pennsylvania's four propeller shafts had been removed, and she was receiving all steam, power, and water from the yard. Although her being in dry dock had excused her from taking part in anti-aircraft drills, her crew swiftly manned her machine guns after the first bombs exploded among the PBY flying boats parked on the south end of Ford Island. Air defense stations then sounded, followed by general quarters. Men knocked the locks off ready-use ammunition stowage, and Pennsylvania opened fire about 8.02. The fleet flagship and the two destroyers nestled in the dry dock ahead of her led a charmed life until dive bombers from Soryu and Hiru targeted the dry dock area between 8.30 and 
one bomb penetrated pennsylvania's boat deck just to the rear of five inch twenty five gun number seven and detonated in casemate number nine of pennsylvania's marine detachment two men privates patrick p tobin and george h wade jr died outright thirteen fell wounded and six were listed as missing three of the wounded corporal morris e nations and jesse c vincent jr and private first class floyd d stewart died later the same day as the onslaught descended upon the battleships and the air station marine detachments hurried to their battle stations on board other ships elsewhere at pearl in the navy yard lay argon a g thirty one the flagship of the base force the heavy cruisers new orleans c a thirty two and san francisco c a thirty eight and the light cruisers honolulu c l forty eight st louis c l forty nine and helena c l fifty to the northeast of ford island lay the light cruiser phoenix c l forty three although utah was torpedoed and sunk at her berth early in the attack her fourteen marines on temporary duty at the fourteenth naval district rifle range found useful employment combating the enemy the fleet machine gun school lay on oahu's south coast west of the pearl harbor entrance channel at fort weaver the men stationed there including several marines on temporary duty from the carrier enterprise and the battleships california and pennsylvania sprang to action at the first sounds of war working with the men from the rifle range all hands set up and mounted guns and broke out and belted ammunition between seven fifty five and eight ten all those present at the range were issued pistols or rifles from the facilities armory soon after the raid began platoon sergeant harold g edwards set about securing the camp against any incursion the japanese might attempt from the landward side and also supervised the emplacement of machine guns along the beach lieutenant j g roy r nelson the officer in charge of the rifle range remembered the many occasions when captain frank m reinecke commanding officer of utah's marine detachment and the senior instructor at the fleet machine gun school and as his naval academy classmates remembered quite a conversationalist had maintained that the school's weapons would be a great asset if anybody ever attacked hawaii by eight ten reinecke's gunners stood ready to prove the point and soon engaged the enemy most likely torpedo planes clearing pearl harbor or high-level bombers approaching from the south nearby army units perhaps alerted by the marines fire opened up soon thereafter unfortunately the eager gunners succeeded in downing one of two s b d s from enterprise that were attempting to reach hickam field an army crash boat fortunately rescued the pilot and his wounded passengers soon thereafter on board argon meanwhile alongside ten ten dock her marines manned her starboard three inch twenty three battery and her machine guns commander fred w connor the ship's commanding officer later credited corporal alfred schlag with shooting down one japanese plane as it headed for battleship row when the attack began helena lay moored alongside ten ten dock the venerable mine layer oglala c m three outboard a signalman standing watch on the light cruiser's signal bridge at seven fifty seven identified the planes over ford island as japanese and the ship went to general quarters before she could fire a shot in her own defense however one eight hundred kilogram torpedo barreled into her starboard side about a minute after the general alarm had begun summoning her men to their battle stations the explosion vented up from the forward engine room through the hatch and passageways catching many of the crew running to their stations and started fires on the third deck platoon sergeant robert w teague privates first class paul f hubner jr and george e johnson and private lester a morris were all severely burned johnson later died 
to the southeast new orleans lay across the pier from her sister ship san francisco the former went to general quarters soon after enemy planes had been sighted dive-bombing fort island around seven fifty seven at eight o five as several low-flying torpedo planes roared by bound for battleship row marine sentries on the fantail opened fire with rifles and forty fives new orleans men meanwhile so swiftly manned the one point one inch seventy five quads and the fifty caliber machine guns under the direction of captain william r collins the commanding officer of the ship's marine detachment that the ship actually managed to shoot at torpedo planes passing her stern san francisco however under major overhaul with neither operative armament nor major caliber ammunition on board was thus restricted to having her men fire small arms at whatever japanese planes came within range some of her crew though hurried over to new orleans which was near missed by one bomb and helped man her five inchers st louis outboard of honolulu went to general quarters at seven fifty seven and opened fire with her one point one quadruple mounted anti-aircraft and fifty caliber machine-gun batteries and after getting her five-inch mounts in commission by eight thirty although without power in train she hauled in her lines at eight forty seven and got under way at nine thirty one with all five inches in full commission by nine forty seven she proceeded to sea passing the channel entrance buoys abeam around ten o'clock honolulu damaged by a near miss from a bomb remained moored at her berth throughout the action phoenix moored by herself in berth c six in pearl harbor to the northeast of fort island noted the attacking planes at seven fifty five and went to general quarters her machine-gun battery opened fire at eight ten on the attacking planes as they came within range her anti-aircraft battery five minutes later ultimately after two false starts where she had gotten under way and left her berth only to see sortie signals cancelled each time phoenix cleared the harbor later that day and put to sea for at least one marine though the day's adventure was not over when the japanese planes departed search flights took off from fort island pilots taking up utility aircraft with scratch crews to look for the enemy carriers which had launched the raid mustered at the naval air station on fort island oklahoma's sergeant haley still clad in his oil-soaked underwear volunteered to go up in a plane that was leaving on a search mission at around eleven thirty he remained aloft in the plane armed with a rifle for some five hours after the attacking planes had retired the grim business of cleaning up and getting on with the war had to be undertaken muster had to be taken to determine who was missing who was wounded who lay dead men sought out their friends and shipmates first lieutenant cornelius c smith jr from the marine barracks at the navy yard searched in vain among the maimed and dying at the naval hospital later that day for his friend harry gaver from oklahoma death respected no rank the most senior marine to die that day was lieutenant colonel daniel r fox the decorated world war i hero and the division marine officer on the staff of the commander battleship division one rear admiral isaac c kidd who along with lieutenant colonel fox had been killed in arizona the tragedy of pearl harbor struck some families with more force than others numbered among arizona's lost were private gordon e shive of the battleship's marine detachment and his brother radioman third-class malcolm h shive a member of the ship's company over the next few days marines from the sunken ships received reassignment to other vessels nevada's marines deployed ashore to set up defensive positions in the fields adjacent to the grounded and listing warship and the dead those who could be found were interred with appropriate ceremony eventually the deeds of marines in the battleship detachments were recognized by appropriate commendations and advancements in ratings chief among them gunnery sergeant douglas sergeant haley and corporals driscoll and darling were each awarded the navy cross 
for his meritorious conduct at the peril of his own life major shapley was commended and awarded the silver star lieutenant simonson was awarded a posthumous bronze star while tennessee's commanding officer commended captain white for the way in which he had directed that battleship's anti-aircraft guns that morning titanic salvage efforts raised some of the sunken battleships california west virginia and nevada and they like the surviving marines went on to play a part in the ultimate defeat of the enemy who had begun the war with such swift and terrible suddenness they caught us flat-footed at seven forty when fuchida's flyers had closed to within a few miles of kahuku point the forty three zero split away from the rest of the formation swinging out north and west of wheeler field the headquarters of the hawaiian air force eighteenth pursuit wing passing further to the south at about seven forty five the soryu and hiru divisions executed a hard diving turn to port and headed north toward wheeler eleven zeros from shokaku and zuikaku simultaneously left the formation and flew east crossing over oahu north of pearl harbor to attack n a s kanahoe bay eighteen from akagi and kaga headed toward what the japanese called babasu point to hikojo barber's point aerodrome iwa mooring mast field sweeping over the waianae range lieutenant commander shiguru itaya led akagi's nine zeros while lieutenant yoshio shiga headed another division of nine from kaga after the initial attack itaya and shiga were to be followed by divisions from soryu under lieutenant masiji suganami and hiru under lieutenant kiyokumu okajima which were at that moment involved in attacking wheeler to the north in the officers mess at iwa the officer of the day captain leonard w ashwell of v m j two five two noticed two formations of aircraft at seven fifty five the first looked like eighteen torpedo planes flying at a thousand feet toward pearl harbor from barber's point but the second to the northwest comprised about twenty one planes just coming over the hills from the direction of nanakuli also at an altitude of about a thousand feet ashwell intrigued by the sight stepped outside for a better look the second formation of single-seat fighters the two divisions from akaji and kaga flew just to the north of iwa and wheeled to the right then flying in a string formation they commenced firing recognizing the planes as japanese ashwell burst back into the mess shouting air raid air raid pass the word he then sprinted for the guardhouse to have call to arms sounded that sunday morning technical sergeant henry h anglin the non-commissioned officer in charge of the photographic section at iwa had driven from his pearl city home with his three-year-old son hank to take the boy's picture at the station the senior anglin had just positioned the lad in front of the camera and was about to take the photo the picture was to be a gift to the boy's grandparents when they heard the mingled noise of airplanes and machine guns roaring down to within twenty-five feet of the ground itaya's group most likely carried out only one pass at their targets before moving on to hickam the headquarters of the hawaiian air force's eighteenth bombardment wing thinking that army pilots were showing off sergeant anglin stepped outside the photographic section tent and along with some other enlisted men watched planes bearing japanese markings strafing the edge of the field then the planes began roaring down toward the field itself and the bullets from their cowl and wing-mounted guns began kicking up puffs of dirt look live ammunition someone said or thought somebody'll go to prison for this shiga pilots like itaya's concentrated on the tactical aircraft lined up neatly on iwa's northwest apron with short bursts of seven point seven and twenty millimeter machine-gun fire shiga's pilots unlike itaya's however reversed course over the treetops and repeated their blistering attacks from the opposite direction within minutes most of mag twenty one's planes sat ablaze and exploding 
black smoke corkscrewing into the sky the enemy spared none of the planes the gray spd ones and twos of vmsb 232 and the seven spare sb 2 u threes left behind by vmsb 231 when they embarked in lexington just two days before vmf 211's remaining f 4 f threes left behind when the squadron deployed to wake well over a week before likewise began exploding in flame and smoke at his home on iwa beach three miles southeast of the air station captain richard c mangram vmsb 232's flight officer sat reading the sunday comics often residents of that area had heard gunnery exercises but on a sunday morning the chatter of gunfire and the dull thump of explosions however drew mangram's attention away from the cartoons as he looked out his front door planes with red ball markings on the wings and fuselage roared by at very low altitude bound for pearl harbor up the valley in the direction of wheeler field smoke was boiling skyward as it was from iwa as he set out for iwa on an old country road wives and children of marines who lived in the iwa beach neighborhood began gathering at the mangrum's house elsewhere in the iwa beach community mrs charles s barker jr wife of master technical sergeant barker the chief clerk in mag twenty one's operations office heard the noise and asked what's all the shooting barker clad only in beach shorts looked out his front door saw and heard a plane fly by at low altitude and then saw splashes along the shoreline from strafing planes marked with red hinumaru running out to turn off the water hose in his front yard and seeing a small explosion nearby probably an anti-aircraft shell from the direction of pearl barker had seen enough he left his wife and baby with his neighbors and set out for iwa the strafers who singled out cars moving along the roads that led to iwa proved no respecter of persons mag twenty one's commanding officer lieutenant colonel claude a sheriff larkin en route from honolulu was about a mile from iwa in his nineteen thirty plymouth when a zero shot at him he momentarily abandoned the car for the relative sanctuary of a nearby ditch not even bothering to turn off the engine and then as the strafer roared out of sight sprinted back to the vehicle jumped back in and sped on he reached his destination at eight o five just in time to be machine-gunned again by one of admiral nagumo's fighters soon thereafter larkin's good fortune at remaining unwounded amidst the attack ran out as he suffered several penetrating wounds the most painful of which included one on the top of the middle finger of his left hand and another on the front of his lower left leg just above the top of his shoe refusing immediate medical attention though larkin continued to direct the defense of iwa field pilots and ground crewmen alike rushed out on to the mat to try to save their planes from certain destruction at least a few pilots intended to get airborne but could not because most of their aircraft were either afire or riddled beyond any hope of immediate use captain milo g haynes of vmf two eleven sought safety behind a tractor he and the machine's driver taking shelter on the side opposite to the strafers another zero came in from another angle however and strafed them from that direction spraying bullets clipped off haines necktie just beneath his chin then as a momentarily relieved haines put his right hand at the back of his head a bullet lacerated his right little finger and a part of his scalp in the midst of the confusion an excited three-year-old hank anglin innocently took advantage of his father's distraction with the battle and wandered toward the mat all of the noise seemed like a lot of fun sergeant anglin ran after his son got him to the ground and shielding him with his own body crawled some thirty-five yards little puffs of dirt coming near them at times as they clambered inside the radio trailer to get out of harm's way a bullet made a hole above the door moving back to the photo tent the elder anglin put his son under a wooden bench as he sat about gathering his camera gear to take pictures of the action a bullet went through his left arm 
deprived of the use of that arm for a time anglin returned to the bench under which his son still crouched obediently to see little hank point to a spent bullet on the floor and hear him warn don't touch that daddy it's hot private first-class james w mann the driver assigned to ewa's 1938 ford ambulance had been refueling the vehicle when the attack began when lieutenant thomas l allman medical corps u s n the group medical officer saw the first planes break into flames he ordered man to take the ambulance to the flight line accompanied by pharmacist mate second class orrin d smith a corpsman from sick bay they sped off the japanese planes seemed to be attracted to the bright red crosses on the ambulance however and halted its progress near the mooring mast realizing that they were under attack man floored the brake pedal and the ford screeched to a halt rather than leave the vehicle for a safer area man and smith crawled underneath it so that they could continue their mission as quickly as possible the strafing however continued unabated ironically the first casualty man had to collect was the man lying prone beside him Orrin Smith felt a searing pain as one of the Japanese 7.7 millimeter rounds found its mark in the fleshy part of his left calf. Seeing that the corpsman had been hurt, man assisted him out from under the vehicle and up into the cab. Despite continued strafing that shot out four tires, man pressed doggedly ahead and delivered the wounded Smith to sick bay after seeing that the corpsman's bleeding was stopped and the painful wound was cleaned and dressed private first-class man sprinted to his own tent grabbing his rifle he then returned to the battered ambulance and shot out tires flopping drove toward ewa's garage there master technical sergeant lawrence r darner directed his men to replace the damaged tires with those from a mobile water purifier meanwhile smith resumed his duties as a member of the dressing station crew also watching the smoke beginning to billow skyward was sergeant duane w shaw u s m c r the driver of the station fire truck normally during off-duty hours the truck sat parked a quarter mile from the landing area shaw figuring that it was his job to put out the fires climbed into the fire engine and set off unfortunately like private first-class man's ambulance sergeant shaw's bright red engine moving across the embattled camp soon attracted strafing zeros unfazed by the enemy fire that perforated his vehicle in several places he drove doggedly toward the flight line until another zero shot out his tires only then pausing to make a hasty estimate of the situation he reasoned that with the fire truck at least temporarily out of service he would have to do something else climbing down from the cab he soon got himself a rifle and some ammunition then he set out for the flight line if he could not put out fires he could at least do some firing of his own at the men who caused them with the parking area cloaked in black smoke japanese fighter pilots shifted their efforts to the planes either out for repairs in the rear areas or to the utility planes parked north of the intersection of the main runways inside ten minutes time machine gun fire likewise transformed many of those planes into flaming wreckage firing only small arms and rifles in the opening stages the marines fought back against kaga's fighters as best they could with almost reckless heroism lieutenant shiga remembered one particular leatherneck who oblivious to the machine gun fire striking the ground around him and kicking up dirt stood transfixed emptying his sidearm at shiga's zero as it roared past Years later, Shigo would describe that lone, defiant, and unknown Marine as the bravest American he had ever met. A tragic drama, however, soon unfolded amidst the Japanese attack. One Marine, Sergeant William E. Lutchen, Jr., USMCR, a truck driver, had been under suspicion of espionage, and he was ordered placed under arrest in the exchange of gunfire that followed his resisting being taken into custody though he was shot dead with that one exception the marines at ewa field had fought back to a man 
as if akagis and kagas fighters had not sown enough destruction on iwa one division of zeros from soiru and one from hiru arrived on the scene fresh from laying waste to many of the plains at wheeler field this second group of fighter pilots went about their work with the same deadly precision exhibited at wheeler only minutes before the raid caught master technical sergeant darner's crew in the middle of changing the tires on the station's ambulance private first-class man who by that point had managed to obtain some ammunition for his rifle dropped down with the rest of the marines at the garage and fired at the attacking fighters as they streaked by lieutenant kiyukumo okajima led his six fighters down through the rolling smoke executing strafing attacks until ground fire holed the forward fuel tank of his wingman petty officer first class kazuo muranaka when okajima discovered the damage to muranaka's plane he decided that his men had pressed their luck far enough and began to assemble his unit and shepherd them toward the rendezvous area some ten miles west of cana point the retiring japanese in all likelihood then spotted incoming planes from enterprise cv six that had been launched at six eighteen to scout a hundred and fifty miles ahead of the ship in nine two plane sections their planned flight path to pearl was to take many of them over iwa mooring mast field where some would encounter japanese aircraft meanwhile back at iwa after what must have seemed an eternity the zeros of the first wave at last wheeled away toward their rendezvous point having made a shambles of the marine air base japanese pilots claimed the destruction of sixty aircraft on the ground akagi's airmen accounted for eleven kaga's fifteen soryu's twelve and hiryu's twenty-two their figures were not too far off the mark for forty-seven aircraft of all types had been parked at the field at the beginning of the onslaught thirty-three of which had been fully operational although the japanese had wreaked havoc upon mag twenty one's complement of planes the group's casualties seemed miraculously light apparently the enemy fighter pilots in the first wave maintained a fairly high degree of discipline eschewing attacks on people and concentrating their attacks on machines many of the was marines however had parked their cars near the center of the station by the time the japanese departed the parking lot resembled a junkyard of mangled automobiles of various makes and models overcoming the initial shock of the first strafing attack iwa's marines took stock of their situation as soon as the last of Italia's and shiga's zeros had departed marines went out and manned stations with rifles and thirty caliber machine guns taken from damaged aircraft and from the squadron ordnance rooms technical sergeant william g turnage an armorer supervised the setting up of the free machine guns technical sergeant anglin meanwhile took his little boy to the guardhouse where a woman motorist agreed to drive hank home to his mother as it would turn out that reunion was not to be accomplished until much later that day inasmuch as the distraught mother had already left home to look for her son master technical sergeant emil s peters a veteran of action in nicaragua had during the first attack reported to the central ordnance tent to lend a hand in manning a gun by the time he arrived there however there were none left to man then he saw a douglas sbd two one of the two spares assigned to vmsb two thirty two parked behind the squadron's tents enlisting the aid of private william g turner vmsb two thirty one squadron clerk peters ran over to the ex lexington machine that still bore her u s n markings to b six pulled the after canopy forward and clambered in the after cockpit stepping hard on the foot pedal to unship the free thirty caliber browning from its housing in the after fuselage and then locking it in place turner having obtained a supply of belted ammunition took his place on the wing as peter's assistant elsewhere nursing his painfully wounded finger and leg lieutenant colonel larkin ordered extra guards posted on the perimeter of the field and on the various roads leading into the base 
men not engaged in active defense went to work fighting the many fires drivers parked what trucks and automobiles had remained intact on the runways to prevent any possible landings by airborne troops although hardly transforming iwa into a fortress the marines ensured that they would be ready for any future attack undoubtedly most of the men at iwa expected correctly that the japanese would return at about eight thirty five enemy planes again made their appearance in the sky over iwa but this time marines stood or crouched ready and waiting for what proved to be lieutenant commander takahashi's dive bombing unit from shokaku returning from its attack on the naval air station at pearl harbor and the army's hickam field roaring in from just above the treetops initially their targets appeared to be the planes but seeing that most had already been destroyed the enemy pilots turned to strafing buildings and people in a heavy and prolonged assault better prepared than they had been when lieutenant commander italia zeros had opened the battle iwa's marines met takahashi's vals with heavy fire from rifles thompson machine guns thirty caliber machine guns and even pistols in retaliation after completing their strafing runs the japanese pilots pulled up in steep wing overs allowing their rear seat gunners to take advantage of the favorable deflection angle to spray the defenders with seven point seven millimeter bullets marine observers later recounted that shokaku's planes also dropped light bombs perhaps of the 60-kilogram variety, as they counted five small craters on the field after the attack. In response to the second onslaught, as they had in the first, all available Marines threw themselves into the desperate defense of their base. The additional strafing attack started numerous fires within the camp area, adding new columns of dense smoke to those still rising from the planes on the parking apron unfortunately the ground fire seemed far more brave than accurate because all of shokaku's dive bombers repeatedly zoomed skyward seemingly unhurt even taking into account possible damage sustained during attacks over ford island and hickam only four of takahashi's planes sustained any damage over oahu before they retired the departure of shokaku's vows afforded lieutenant colonel larkin the opportunity to reorganize the camp defenses there was ammunition to be distributed wounded men to be succored and seemingly innumerable fires burning amidst the tents buildings and plains to be extinguished however around nine thirty yet another flight of enemy planes appeared about fifteen vows from kaga and hiryu although the pilots of those planes had expended their two hundred and fifty kilogram bombs on ships at pearl harbor they still apparently retained plenty of seven point seven millimeter ammunition and seemed determined to expend much of what remained upon iwa as in the previous attacks by shokaku's vows the last group came in at very low altitude from just over the tops of the trees surrounding the station quite taken by the high maneuverability of the nimble dive bombers which they were seeing at close hand for the second time that day the marines mistook them for fighter aircraft with fixed landing gear around that time lieutenant colonel larkin saw an american plane and a japanese one collide in mid-air a short distance away from the field in all probability larkin saw enterprises ensign john h l vox dauntless collide with a vow. Vogt had become separated from his section leader during the pearl-bound flight in from the carrier, may have circled offshore, and then arrived over Iwa in time to encounter dive bombers from Kaga or Hiryu. Vogt and his passenger, radioman third-class Sidney Pierce, bailed out of their SBD, but at too low an altitude, for both died in the trees when their chutes failed to deploy fully neither of the japanese crewmen escaped from their vow when it crashed fortunately for the marines however the last raid proved comparatively light and ineffectual something lieutenant colonel larkin attributed to the heavy gunfire thrown skyward the short respite between the second and third strafing attacks 
had allowed iwa's defenders to bring all possible weapons to bear against the japanese technical sergeant turnage after having gotten the base's machine guns set up and ready for action took over one of the mounts himself and fired several bursts into the belly of one vow that began trailing smoke and began to falter soon thereafter turnage however was by no means the only marine using his weapon to good effect master technical sergeant peters and private turner from their improvised position in the lamed spd had let fly at whatever valves came within range of their guns the two marines shot down what witnesses thought were at least two of the attacking planes and discouraged strafing in that area of the station however the japanese soon tired of the tenacious bravery of the grizzled veteran and the young clerk neither of whom flinched in the face of repeated strafing two particular enemy pilots repeatedly peppered the grounded dauntless with seven point seven millimeter fire ultimately scoring hits near the cockpit area and wounding both men turner toppled from the wing mortally wounded another marine who distinguished himself during the third strafing attack was sergeant carlo a micheletto of marine utility squadron v m j two five two during the first japanese attack that morning micheletto proceeded at once to v m j two fifty two's parking area and went to work helping in the attempts to extinguish the fires that had broken out amongst the squadron's parked utility planes he continued in those labors until the last strafing attack began. Putting aside his firefighting equipment and grabbing a rifle, he took cover behind a small pile of lumber and, heedless of the heavy machine gunning, continued to fire at the attacking planes until a burst of enemy fire struck him in the head and killed him instantly. End of Part 2 Part 3 of Infamous Day, Marines at Pearl Harbor, 7 December 1941, by Robert James Cressman and J. Michael Winger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eventually, in an almost predictable way, the Japanese planes formed up and flew off to the west, leaving the once neatly manicured mooring mast field smoldering. The Marines had barely had time to catch their collective breath, when, at ten o'clock, almost as a capstone to the complete chaos wreaked by the initial Japanese attack, seven more planes arrived. Their markings, however, were of a more familiar variety, red-centered blue and white stars. The newcomers proved to be a group of dauntlesses from Enterprise. For the better part of an hour, Lieutenant Wilmer E. Gallagher, executive officer of Scouting Squadron 6, had circled fitfully over the Pacific swells south of Oahu, waiting for the situation there to settle down. At about 9.45, when he had seen that the skies seemed relatively clear of Japanese planes, Gallagher decided rather than face friendly fire over Pearl, he would go to Iwa instead. They had barely stopped on the strip, however, when a Marine ran out to Gallagher's plane and yelled, For God's sake, get into the air or they'll strafe you too. Other Enterprise pilots likewise saw ground crews frantically motioning for them to take off immediately. Instructed to take off and stay in the air until the air raid was over, the Enterprise pilots took off and headed for Pearl Harbor. Although all seven SPDs left Iwa, only three, Gallagher's, his wingman, Ensign William P. West, and Ensign Cleo J. Dobson's, would make it as far as Ford Island. A tremendous volume of anti-aircraft fire over the harbor rose to meet what was thought to be yet another attack. Seeing the reception accorded Gallagher, West, and Dobson, the other four pilots, Lt. J. G. Hart D. Hilton, and Ensigns Carl T. Fogg, Edwin J. Kroger, and Frederick T. Weber, wheeled around and headed back to Iwa, landing around 10.15, to find a far better reception that time around. Within a matter of minutes, the Marines began rearming and refueling Hilton's, Kroger's, and Weber's SPDs. The Marines discovered that Fogg's Dauntless, though, had taken a hit and had holed a fuel tank and would require repairs. Although it is unlikely that even one of the Iwa Marines thought so at the time, 
even as they serviced the enterprise sbds which sat on the landing mat the japanese raid on oahu was over vice admiral nagumo already feeling that he had pushed his luck far enough was eager to get as far away from the waters north of oahu as soon as possible at least for the time being the marines at iwa had nothing to fear not privy to the musings of nagumo and his staff however lieutenant colonel larkin could only wonder what the marines would do should the japanese return at ten twenty five he completed a glum assessment of the situation and forwarded it to admiral kimmel while casualties among the marines had been light two men had been killed and several wounded the japanese had destroyed all bombing fighting and transport planes on the ground iwa had no radio communications no power and only one small gas generator in commission he also informed the commander-in-chief pacific fleet that he would retain the four enterprise planes at iwa until further orders larkin also notified wheeler field control of the sbds being held at his field at eleven hundred wheeler called and directed all available planes to rendezvous with a flight of b-17s over hickam lieutenant j g hilton and the two ensigns from bombing squadron six kroger and weber took off at eleven fifteen and the marines never heard from them again finding no army planes over hickam two flights of b-17s and douglas a-20s had only just departed the three navy pilots landed at ford island ensign fogg's s p d represented the sole naval strike capability at iwa as the day ended they caught us flat-footed larkin unabashedly wrote major general ross e roll of the events of seven december over the next few months iwa would serve as the focal point for marine aviation activities on oahu as the service acquired replacement aircraft and began rebuilding to carry out the mission of standing ready to deploy with the fleet wherever it was required they're kicking the hell out of pearl harbor although the japanese accorded the battleships and air facilities priority as targets for destruction on the morning of seven december nineteen forty one it was natural that the onslaught touched the marine barracks at pearl harbor navy yard as well colonel william e farthing army air forces commanding officer of hickam field thought that he was witnessing some very realistic maneuvers shortly before eight hundred hours that morning from his vantage point virtually next door to the navy yard farthing watched what proved to be six japanese dive bombers swooping down toward ford island he thought that mag twenty one's s b two u's or s b d s were out for an early morning practice hop i wonder what the marines are doing to the navy so early sunday over at the marine barracks the officer of the guard second lieutenant arnold d swartz after having inspected his sentries had retired to the officer of the day's room to await breakfast stepping out on to the lanai or patio at about seven fifty five to talk to the field music about morning colors he noticed several planes diving in the direction of the naval air station he thought initially that it seemed a bit early for practice bombing but then saw a flash and heard the resulting explosion that immediately dispelled any illusions he might have held that what he was seeing was merely an exercise seeing a plane with red balls on the wings roar by at low level convinced swartz that japanese planes were attacking over in the squad room of barracks b first lieutenant harry f noyes jr the range officer for battery e three inch anti-aircraft group third defense battalion heard the sound of a loud explosion coming from the direction of the harbor at about seven fifty first assuming that blasting crews were busy there had been a lot of construction recently noyes cocked his ears the new sound seemed a bit different more higher pitched and louder at that he sprang from his bed ran across the room and peered northward just in time to see a dirty column of water rising from the harbor from another explosion and a japanese plane pulling out of its dive the plane bearing red hinomaru rising sun insignia under its wings left no doubt as to its identity 
the explosions likewise awakened lieutenant colonel william j whaling and major james jerry monahan who while colonel gilder d jackson commanding officer of the marine barracks was at sea in indianapolis ca thirty five en route to johnston island for tests of higgins landing boats shared his quarters at pearl harbor shortly after o eight hundred whaling rolled over and asked jerry don't you think the admiral is a little bit inconsiderate of guests monahan then also awake replied i'll go down and see about it whaling meanwhile lingered in bed until more blasts rattled the quarter's windows thinking that he had not seen any five-inch guns emplaced close to the building and that something was wrong he got up and walked over to the window that faced the harbor looking out he saw smoke and turning remarked this thing is so real that i believe that's an oil tank burning right in front there both men then dressed and hurried across the parade ground where they encountered lieutenant colonel elmer e hall commanding officer of the second engineer battalion elmer whaling said amily this is a mighty fine show you are putting on i've never seen anything quite like it meanwhile schwartz ordered the field music to sound the call to arms then running into the officer's section of the mess hall schwartz informed the officer of the day first lieutenant cornelius c smith jr who had been enjoying a cup of coffee with marine gunner floyd mccorkle when the sharp blasts had rocked the building that the japanese were attacking like schwartz they ran out onto the lanai standing there speechless they watched the first enemy planes diving on ford island marines began to stumble eyes wide in disbelief from the barracks some were lurching on the run into pants and shirts a few wore only towels schwartz then ordered one of the platoon sergeants to roust out the men and get them under cover of the trees outside smith too then ran outside to the parade ground as he looked at the rising smoke in the japanese planes he doubted those who had derided the japs as cross-eyed second-rate pilots who couldn't hit the broad side of a barn door it was enough to turn his stomach they're kicking the hell out of pearl harbor he thought meanwhile unable to reach colonel harry b pickett the fourteenth naval district marine officer as well as colonel jackson and captain samuel r shaw commanding officer of company a by telephone schwartz sent runners to the officers respective quarters he then ordered a non-commissioned officer from the quartermaster department to dispense arms and ammunition while schwartz organized the men beneath the trees outside the barracks lieutenant noyes dressed and then drove across the parade ground to building two seventy seven arriving about eight o five at the same time like schwartz first lieutenant james s o'halloran the third defense battalion duties officer and commanding officer of battery f three inch anti-aircraft group wanted to get in touch with his senior officers after having had assembly sounded and signaling his men to take cover o'halloran ordered marine gunner frederick m steinhauser the assistant battalion communications officer to telephone all of the officers who resided outside the reservation and inform them of the attack in honolulu mustachio de major harold c roberts acting commanding officer of the third defense battalion since lieutenant colonel robert h pepper had accompanied colonel jackson to sea in indianapolis after taking steinhauser's call with word of the bombing of pearl jumped into his car along with his neighbor major kenneth w benner commanding officer of the three-inch anti-aircraft group and the headquarters and service battery of the third defense battalion as robert's car crept through the heavy traffic toward pearl the two officers could see japanese aircraft flying along the coast when they reached the water street fish market a large crowd of what seemed to be japanese residents cheering the japanese planes waving to them and trying to obstruct traffic to pearl harbor by pushing parked cars into the street blocked their way 
meanwhile as his acting battalion commander was battling his way through honolulu's congested streets o'halloran was organizing his marines as they poured out of the barracks into groups to break out small arms and machine guns from the various battalion storerooms after harry noyes drove up o'halloran told him to do what he could to get the three-inch guns and fire control equipment if available broken out and set up and then instructed other marines to get tractors and start hauling guns to the parade ground another detail of men hurried off to recover an anti-aircraft director that lay crated and ready for shipment to midway marines continued to stream out into the grounds having been ordered out of the barracks with their rifles and cartridge belts they doubled the sentry posts and received instructions to stand ready and armed to deploy in an emergency noise saw some marines who had not been assigned any task commencing fire on enemy planes which were considerably out of range at the main gate of the navy yard the marines fired at whatever planes came close enough sailors from the high-speed mine layer sea card dm twenty one en route to their ship later attested to seeing one japanese plane shot down by the guards rifle fire tai sing lu who was to have photographed those guards at the new gate had left honolulu in a hurry when he heard the sound of explosions and gunfire and saw the rising columns of smoke he arrived at the naval reservation without his graflex and soon marveled at the cool bravery of the young fighting marines who stood their ground under fire blazing away at enemy planes with rifles while keeping traffic moving finally the more senior officers quartered outside the reservation began showing up when colonel pickett arrived lieutenant schwartz returned to the officer of the day's room and found that captain shaw had reached there also securing from his position as officer of the guard schwartz returned to his three-inch gun battery being set up near building two seventy seven ordering marines out of the building he managed to obtain a steel helmet and a pistol each for himself and lieutenant o'halloran captain samuel g taxis commanding officer of the third defense battalion's five-inch artillery group meanwhile witnessed terrific confusion ensuing from his men's effort to obtain ammunition steel helmets and other items of equipment meanwhile the comparatively few marines of lieutenant colonel's bert a bones first defense battalion most of which garrisoned wake johnston and palmyra made their presence felt urged on by lieutenant noyes one detail of men immediately reported to the battalion gunshed and storerooms and issued rifles and ammunition to all comers while another detachment worked feverishly assembling machine guns navy yard workmen engine men lokana kipifu and uh, oliver bright fireman gerard williams and rigger ernest w birch appeared looking for some way to help the marines who soon put them to work distributing ammunition to the machine gun crews soon the marines at the barracks added the staccato hammering of automatic weapons fire to the general din around them meanwhile other marines from the first defense battalion broke out firefighting equipment as shrapnel from exploding anti-aircraft shells began to strike the roof of the barracks and adjacent buildings at about eight twenty majors roberts and benner reached the marine barracks just in time to observe the beginning of the japanese second wave attacks against pearl roberts found that lieutenant o'halloran had gotten the third battalion ready for battle with seven fifty caliber and six thirty caliber machine guns set up and with ammunition belted under captain harry o smith jr commanding officer of battery h machine gun group third defense battalion the third's marine gunners had already claimed one japanese plane shot down lieutenant noyes was meanwhile in the process of deploying seven three-inch guns three on the west end of the parade ground and four on the east sergeant major leland h alexander of the headquarters and service battery of the third defense battalion suggested to lieutenant o'halloran that an armed convoy be organized to secure ammunition for the guns as none was available in the navy yard proper roberts gave alexander permission to put together the requisite trucks weapons and men 
Lieutenant Colonel Bone had the same idea, and accordingly dispatched a truck at 8.30 to the nearest ammunition dump near Fort Kamehameha. Bone ordered another group of men from the 5-inch battery to the naval ammunition depot at Luelue just in case. He hoped that at least one truck would get through the maelstrom of traffic. Marines from the 2nd Engineer Battalion made ammunition runs as well as provided men and motorcycles for messengers. Meanwhile, Roberts directed Major Benner to have the 3rd Battalion's guns operational before the ammunition trucks returned, and to set the fuses for a thousand yards, since the guns lacked the necessary height-finding equipment. The makeshift emplacements, however, presented less than ideal firing positions since the barracks and nearby yard buildings restricted the field of fire and many of the low-flying planes appeared on the horizon only for an instant. Necessity often being the mother of invention, Roberts devised an impromptu fire control system, stationing a warning section of eight men equipped with field glasses and led by Lieutenant Schwartz in the center of the parade ground. The spotters were to pass the word to a group of field musics who, using their instruments, were to sound appropriate warnings. One blast meant planes approaching from the north, two blasts from the east, and so on. Taking precautions against fires in the temporary wooden barracks, Roberts ordered hoses run out and extinguishers placed in front of them, along with shovels, axes, and buckets of sand, the latter to deal with incendiary bombs. Hose, reels, and chemical carts placed near the center hydrant near the mess hall, and all possible containers filled with water for both fighting fires and drinking. In addition, he ordered cooks and messmen to prepare coffee and fill every other container on hand with water, and organized riflemen in groups of about sixteen to sit on the ground with an officer or non-commissioned officer in charge to direct their fire. He also called for runners from all groups in the battalion and established his command post at the parade ground's south corner and ordered the almost 150 civilians who had showed up looking for ways to help out to report to the machine-gun storeroom and fill ammunition belts and clean weapons. Among other actions, he also instructed the battalion sergeant major to be ready to safeguard important papers from the headquarters barracks. Prior to Robert's arrival, Lieutenant J.G. William R. Franklin, Dental Corps, USN, the dental officer for the 3rd Defense Battalion's headquarters and service battery, and the only medical officer present, had organized first aid and stretcher parties in the barracks. As the other doctors arrived, Roberts directed them to set up dressing stations at each battalion headquarters and one at sick bay. Elsewhere, Marines vacated one 100-man temporary barracks, the non-commissioned officers' club, and the post exchange to ready them for casualties. Parties of Marines also reported to the waterfront area to assist in collecting and transporting casualties from the ships in the harbor to the naval hospital. By the time the Marines had gotten their new fire precautions in place, the Japanese second wave attack was in full swing. Although their pilots selected targets exclusively from among the Pacific Fleet warships, the Marines at the barracks in the Navy Yard still were able to take the Japanese planes, most of which seemed to be coming in from the west and southwest under fire. While Marines were busily setting up the three-inch guns, several civilian yard workmen grabbed up rifles and brought their fire to bear upon the enemy, allowing Schwartz's men to continue their work. The Japanese eventually put Major Roberts' ingenious fire control methods, the field musics, to the test. After hearing four hearty blasts from the bandsmen, the fifty calibers began hammering out cones of tracer that caught two low-flying dive bombers as they pulled out of their runs over Pearl, prompting Roberts' fear that the ships would fire at them, too, and hit the barracks. One valve slanted earthward near what appeared to be either the west end of the lower tank farm or the south end of the naval hospital reservation, while the other, emitting great quantities of smoke, crashed west-southwest of the parade ground. 
although the marines success against their tormentors must have seemed sweet indeed a skeptical captain taxis thought it more likely that the crews of the two valves bagged by the machine gunners had just run out of luck most of the firing in his opinion had been quite ineffectual mostly directed at enemy planes far beyond range of the weapons and merely fired into the air at no target at all gunners on board the fleet's warships were faring little better almost simultaneously with the dive bombing attacks horizontal bombing attacks began major roberts noted that the eighteen bombers flew in two v's of nine planes each in column of v's and that they kept a good formation at least some of those planes appeared to have bombed the battleship pennsylvania and the destroyers casson and downs in dry dock number one in the confusion however roberts probably saw two divisions of kate's from suikaku preparing for their attack runs on hickam field a single division of such planes from shokaku meanwhile attacked the navy yard and the naval air station well removed from the barracks marines assigned to the navy yard's fire department rendered invaluable assistance in leading critical firefighting efforts heading the department sergeant harold f abbott supervised the distribution of the various units and coordinated the flood of volunteers who stepped forward to help one of abbott's men private first-class marion m milbrant with his one thousand gallon pumper summoned to the naval hospital grounds found that one of kaga's kates struck by machine-gun fire from the ships moored in the repair basin had crashed near there the resulting fire fed by the crashed plane's gasoline threatened the facility but milbrant and his crew controlled the blaze other marine firefighters were hard at work alongside dry dock number one pennsylvania had not been the only ship not fully ready for war since she lay immobile at one end of the dry dock downs lay in the dock undergoing various items of work while casson had been having ordnance alterations at the yard and thus had none of her five inch thirty eights ready for firing both destroyers soon came in for some unwanted attention as bombs turned the two destroyers into cauldrons of flames and their crews abandoned ship two sailors from downs meanwhile sprinted over to the marine barracks gunner's mate first-class michael g odetas and gunner's mate second-class curtis p schultz after the order to abandon ship had been given both had on their own initiative gone to the marine barracks to assist in the distribution of arms and ammunition they soon returned however each gunner's mate with a browning automatic rifle in hand to do his part in fighting back utilizing three of the department's pumpers meanwhile the first firefighters from the yard who included corporal john gimson privates first class william m brashear william a hopper peter curtikes frank w ferret marvin d dalman and corporal milbrant among them soon arrived and began to play water on the burning ships at about nine fifteen four torpedo warheads on board downs cooked off and exploded the concussion tearing the hoses from the hands of the men fighting the blazes and sending fragments everywhere temporarily forcing all hands to retreat to the nearby road and sprawl there knocked flat several times by the explosions the marines and other firefighters which included men from casson and downs and civilian yard workmen remained on the job explosions continued to rack the two destroyers while subsequent partial flooding of the dock caused casson to pivot on her forefoot and heel over onto her sister ship working under the direction of lieutenant william r spear a fifty-seven-year-old retired naval officer called to the colors the firemen were understandably concerned that the oil fires burning in proximity to the two destroyers might drift aft in the partially flooded dry dock and breach the caisson unleashing a wall of water that would carry pennsylvania three of whose four propeller shafts had been pulled for overhaul down upon the burning destroyers 
preparing for that eventuality private first-class don o femmer in charge of the seven hundred and fifty gallon pumper stood ready should the conflagration spread to the northeast through the dock Fortunately, circumstances never required Femmer and his men to defend the caisson from fire, but the young private had more than his share of troubles when his pumper broke down at what could have been a critical moment. Undaunted, Femmer made temporary repairs and stood his ground at the caisson throughout the raid. At the opposite end of the dry dock, meanwhile, Private First Class Omar E. Hill fared little better with his 500-gallon pumper. As if the firefighting labors were not arduous enough, a ruptured circulating water line threatened to shut down his fire engine. Holding a rag on the broken line while his comrades raced away to obtain spare parts, Hill kept his pumper in the battle meanwhile firefighters on the west side of the dock succeeded in passing three hoses to men on pennsylvania's forecastle where they directed blasts of water ahead of the ship and down the starboard side to prevent the burning oil which resembled a seething cauldron from drifting aft a second five hundred gallon engine crew led by private first class dolman battled the fires at the southwest end of the dry dock despite the suffocating oily black smoke billowing forth from caisson and downs eventually by ten thirty five the marines and other volunteers who included the indomitable tai sing lu had succeeded in quelling the fires on board caisson those on board downs were put out early that afternoon more work however lay in store for corporal milbrand and his crew between seven fifty five and o nine hundred three valves had attacked the destroyer shaw d d three seven three which shared y f d two with the little yard tug sotoyomo all three scored hits fires ultimately reached shaw's forward magazines and triggered an explosion that sent tendrils of smoke into the sky and severed the ship's bow several other volunteer units were already battling the blaze with hose carts and two three hundred and fifty gallon pumpers sent in from honolulu milbrand aided as well by the pan american airways fireboat normally stationed at pearl city ultimately succeeded in extinguishing the stricken destroyers fires in the meantime after having pounded the military installations on oahu for nearly two hours between nine forty and ten hundred the japanese planes made their way westward to return to the carrier decks from whence they had arisen with the respite offered by the enemy's departure no one knew for sure whether or not they would be back the marines at last found time to take stock of their situation fortunately the marine barracks lay some distance away from what had interested the japanese the most the ships in the harbor proper although some shell fragments literally rained at times the material loss sustained by the barracks was slight moreover it had been american gunfire from the ships in the harbor rather than bombs from japanese planes overhead that had inflicted the damage at one point that morning a three-inch anti-aircraft shell crashed through the roof of a storehouse the only damage sustained by the barracks during the entire attack considering the carnage at the fields on oahu and especially among the units of the pacific fleet only four men of the third defense battalion had been wounded sergeant samuel h cobb jr of the third defense battalion three-inch anti-aircraft group suffered head injuries serious enough to warrant his being transferred to the naval hospital for treatment while private first class jules b myron and private william j whitcomb of the machine gun group and sergeant leo hendricks the second of the headquarters and service battery suffered less serious injuries in addition two men sent with the trucks to find ammunition for the three-inch batteries suffered injuries when they fell off the vehicles in their subsequent reports the defense battalion and barracks officers declined to single out individuals noting no outstanding individual behavior during the raid only the steady discharge of duty expected of marines 
to be sure great confusion existed especially at first but the command quickly settled down to work and showed no more than the usual excitement and no trace of panic or even uneasiness if anything the marines tended to place themselves at risk unnecessarily as they went about their business coolly and in many cases in utter disregard of their own safety major roberts recommended that the entire third defense battalion be commended for their initiative coolness under fire and the alacrity with which they emplaced their guns commendations however were not the order of the day on seven december although the japanese had left the marines expected them to return and finish the job they had begun many japanese pilots including fushida wanted to do just that if another attack was to come there was much to do to prepare for it as the skies cleared of enemy planes the marines at the barracks secured their establishment and took steps to complete the work already begun on the defences at ten thirty the third defense battalion's corporal of the guard moved to the barracks and set the battalion's radio to the army information service frequency thus enabling them to pass flash messages to all groups the marines also distributed gas masks to all hands the morning and afternoon passed quickly the men losing track of time the initial confusion experienced during the opening moments of the raid had by that point given way to at least some semblance of order as officers and noncoms arrived from leave and began to sort out their commands at eleven o five the third defense battalion's battery g deployed to makeshift defense positions as an infantry reserve in some ditches dug for building foundations all of the messmen many of whom had taken an active hand in the defense of the barracks against the japanese attack returned to the three general mess halls and opened up an around-the-clock service to all comers including about six thousand meals to the civilian workmen of the navy yard a service discontinued only after the food supply at the regular established eating places could be replenished by eleven hundred at least some of the three-inch batteries were emplaced and ready to answer any future japanese raids at the north end of the parade ground the third defense battalion's battery d stood ready for action at eleven thirty five while another battery consisting of three guns and an anti-aircraft director the one originally earmarked for midway lay at the south end at twelve twenty major roberts organized his battalion's strength into six task groups task group number one was to double the navy yard guard force number two was to provide anti-aircraft defense and number three was to provide machine gun defense number four was to provide infantry reserve and firefighting crews number five was to coordinate transportation and number six was to provide ammunition and equipment as well as messing and billeting support by thirteen hundred meanwhile all the fires in dry dock number one had been extinguished permitting the marine and civilian firefighters to secure their hard-worked equipment although the two battered destroyers casson and downs appeared to be total losses those who had battled the blaze could take great satisfaction in knowing that they had not only spared pennsylvania from serious fire damage but had also played a major role in saving the dry dock as tai sing lu recounted later in his own brand of english the marines of the fire department of the navy yard are the heroes of the day of december seventh nineteen forty one that saved the casson and downs and u s s pennsylvania in dry dock number one later that afternoon battery d's four officers and sixty eight enlisted men with four thirty caliber machine guns sent along with them for good measure moved from the barracks over to hickam field to provide the army installation some measure of anti-aircraft protection hickam also benefited from the provision of the second engineer battalion's service and equipment after the attack the battalion's dump truck and two bulldozers lumbered over to the stricken air base to assist in clearing what remained of the bombers that had been parked wingtip to wingtip and filling bomb craters 
Around 1530, a marine patrol approached Tai Sing Lu, a familiar figure about the navy yard, and asked him to do them a favor. They had had no lunch. Some had had no breakfast because of the events of the day. Going to the garage, Lou rode his bright red putt-putt over to the 3rd Defense Battalion mess hall and related to his old friend, Technical Sergeant Joseph A. Newland, the tale of the hungry Marines. Newland and his messmen prepared ham and chicken sandwiches, and Lou made the rounds of all the posts he could reach. In the afternoon and early evening hours of 7 December, the men received reports that their drinking water was poisoned and that various points on Oahu were being bombed and or invaded. In the absence of any real news, such alarming reports, especially when added to the already nervous state of the defenders, only fueled the fear and paranoia prevalent among all ranks and rates. In addition, most of the men were exhausted after their exertions of the morning and afternoon. Dog-tired, many would remain on duty for thirty-six hours without relief. Drawn, unshaven faces and puffy eyes were common. Tense, expectant, and anxious marines and sailors at Pearl spent a fitful night on the 7th. It is little wonder that mistakes would be made that would have tragic consequences, especially in the Stygian darkness of that first blacked-out Hawaiian night following the raid. Still some hours away from Oahu, the carrier Enterprise and her air group had been flying searches and patrols throughout the day in a so far fruitless effort to locate the Japanese carrier force south of oahu one of her pilots spotted what he thought was a japanese ship and enterprise launched a thirty-one plane strike at sixteen forty two nagumo's fleet however was homeward bound while enterprise recovered the torpedo planes and dive bombers after their fruitless search she directed the fighters to land at n a s pearl harbor machine guns on board the battleship pennsylvania opened fire on the flight as it came for a landing though and soon the entire harbor exploded into a fury of gunfire as cones of tracers converged on the incoming wildcats three of the f four f's slanted earthward almost immediately a fourth crashed a short time later two managed to land at ford island the third defense battalion's journalist later recorded that six planes with running lights under four hundred feet altitude tried ford island landings and were machine gunned it was a tragic footnote to what had been a terrible day indeed the marines at pearl harbor had been surprised by the attack that descended upon them but they rose to the occasion and fought back in the best tradition of the naval service while the enemy had attacked with tenacity and daring no less so was the response from the marines on board the battleships and cruisers at ewa mooring mast field and at the marine barracks one can only think that admiral isaruko yamamoto's worst fears of america's terrible resolve and that he had awakened a sleeping giant would have been confirmed if he could have peered into the faces so deeply etched with grim determination of the marines who had survived the events of that december day in nineteen forty one pearl harbor remembered several of the many memoirs in the marine corps oral history collection are by marines who were serving at pearl harbor on seven december nineteen forty one and personally witnessed the japanese attack two such memoirs one by lieutenant general alan shapley and a second by brigadier general samuel r shaw vividly describe the events of that day as they remembered it general shapley a major in december nineteen forty one had been relieved as commander of arizona's marine detachment on the sixth he recalled i was just finishing my breakfast and i was just about ready to go to my room and get in my baseball uniform to play the enterprise for the baseball championship of the united states fleet when i heard this terrible bang and crash i thought it was a motor sailor that they had dropped on the fantail and i ran up there to see what it was all about when i got up on deck there the sailors were aligned on the railing there looking towards pearl harbor and i heard two or three of them say this is the best damned drill the army air corps ever put on then we saw a destroyer being blown up in the dry dock across the way 
the first thing i knew was when the fantail which was wood was being splintered when we were being strafed by machine guns and then there was a little bit of confusion and i can remember this because they passed the word on ship that all unengaged personnel get below the third deck you see in a battleship the third deck is the armored deck and so realizing what was going on this attack and being strafed the unengaged personnel were ordered below the third deck that started some people going down the ladders then right after that the pennsylvania which was the flagship of the whole fleet put up these signals go to general quarters so that meant that the people were going the other way too lieutenant carlton e simonson did quite a job of turning some of the sailors around and we went up in the director on the way up the mainmast tripod lieutenant simonson was killed he caught a burst through the heart and almost knocked me off the tripod because i was behind him on the ladder and i boosted him up in the searchlight platform and went in to my director and of course when i got out there there were only seven or eight men there and i thought we were all going to get cooked to death because i couldn't see anything but fire below after a while i stayed there and watched this whole attack because i had a grandstand seat for that and then it got pretty hot anyway the wind was blowing from the stern to the stem and i sent the men down and got those men off then i apparently got knocked off or blown off i was pretty close to shore there was a dredging pipeline that ran between the ship and ford island and i guess that i was only about twenty-five yards from the pipeline and ten yards from ford island and managed to get ashore i wasn't so much covered with oil i didn't have any clothes on the burning fuel oil burnt all my clothes off i walked up to the airfield which wasn't very bright of me because this was still being attacked at first i wanted to get a machine gun in the administration building but i couldn't do that then i was given a boat cloak from one of my men it was quite a sight to see four hundred or five hundred men walking around all burnt just like charred steak you could just see their eyes and their mouths it was terrible later i went over to the island and went to the marine barracks and got some clothes at the marine barracks captain samuel r shaw who commanded one of the two barracks companies vividly remembered that sunday morning as well the boat guards were in place and the music was out there and the old and new officer of the day and we had a music and a hell of a fine sergeant bugler who had been in shanghai he would stand beside the officers of the day and there came the airplanes and he looked up and said captain those are japanese warplanes and one of the two of them said my god they are sound the call to arms so the bugler started sounding the call to arms before the first bomb hit of course they had already started taking out the machine guns they didn't wait for the key in the od's office they just broke the door down and hauled out the machine guns put them in position everybody that wasn't involved in that drill grabbed their rifles and ran out in the parade ground and started firing at the airplanes they must have had several hundred men out there with rifles and every japanese plane that was recovered there or pieces of it had lots of thirty caliber holes somebody was hitting them machine guns or rifles then i remembered here we had all these guys on the post who had not been relieved and they had been posted at four o'clock and some nine o'clock nine thirty they not only had not been relieved but had no chow and no water so i got hold of the mess sergeant and told him to organize to go round to the posts they had a depot at the beginning it was a supply depot i told him to send a party over there and draw a lot of canteens and make sandwiches and we'd send water and sandwiches around to the guys on posts until we found out some way to relieve all these guys and get people back then he told me that it was fine except that he didn't have nearly enough messmen they were all out in the parade ground shooting i think the second phase of planes came in at that time and we had a hell of an uproar end of part three end of infamous day marines at pearl harbor seven december nineteen forty one by robert j cressman and j michael winger